Good morning, and a huge thank you to Current Archaeology for organising this event and inviting me to speak. It's been a strange year, to say the least, but we must always look for silver linings in these strange times. And for the Nessa Brodger, the lack of actual fieldwork has allowed us more time to bring together a major interim volume on the site and consolidate some of our ideas, some of which I'll touch on today. Investigations at the Ness have come a long way from our initial test pits and trenches back in 2004 to something a little more extensive, but this is still less than 10% of the site, still plenty for future generations of archaeologists to unravel. But as you might expect, one of the most common questions we are asked, and indeed ask ourselves, is what is it? This is not easy as the site is complex and was in use throughout the Neolithic and Orkney from about 3,500 to 2,300 BC. And throughout this period, we see quite dramatic changes taking place. For instance, in styles of architecture, which no doubt reflect the changes in both how the site was used and the dynamics and indeed fortunes of Neolithic society. Throughout its long history, one recurring theme seems to be present, consumption, which at times was very conspicuous and indicates large gatherings or feasting was paramount. Perhaps embedded in this was a rivalry between groups as they competed in this ever-changing arena of the Neolithic. This, however, is not just the consumption of food, but also raw materials on a grand scale, which would reflect the status and importance of the Ness, not just to the local ne Orcadian Neolithic population, but also more widely. You can see this most clearly in the buildings at the Ness, Here's a very simplified plan of the main buildings in our largest trench, with many more indicated by geophysics. The concentration of such buildings on such a scale is unparalleled. In order to build them, tens of thousands of tons of stone would have been required. They don't, not only had to be quarried, but also transported and then put together. A massive undertaking consuming time, resources and person power. Some of the stone would have been recycled as some structures were demolished or fell out of use and the stone robbed for reuse. But this still represents a huge planning and logistical effort. <clears throat> Walls that today survive to over a metre in height as in Structure 12 were originally half as high again as extrapolated from in situ collapse we have found. Or well, the monumental Structure 10 that has walls over four metres thick or well, the enclosing walls that define the earlier phases of the Ness, walls up to six metres thick and surviving, as we see here, to almost two metres in height. How much higher they were is open to debate. Some of the stone sources may have been quite local, potentially even from the shores of the two locks on either side of the Ness, but other blocks have come from several kilometres away. The special quality sought out, such as these that have subsequently been picturesque for the internal divisions in structure 12. For locations that were exploited due to the color of the sandstone present, as in the interior of structure 10, this must have added that extra wow factor to an already exceptional building. The nearest source for these colored sandstones are several miles away. Several millennia later, we see the same selection of colored sandstone being used to great effect in St. Magnus's Cathedral in Kirkwall. It was also the scale of some of the slabs required, such as those in Structure 27, a unique and remarkable building, even by Ness standards. Where we see the interior clad in upright orthostats, partially supported by massive slabs, some over four and a half meters long. These may have been repurposed standing stones or came from the same quarries that supplied stone for the Great Stone Circle. Special quarries such as Vestrofjol, just above Scarra Bray, where we can still see such slabs had been prized out of the bedrock awaiting transportation. And also other specialist quarries that would have, that could have produced materials suitable for splitting to create slates used to roof many of the nest buildings, a technique still used in Orkney today. So in terms of stone alone, the Ness should be seen as a massive consumer. Not that Orkney lacks a plethora of good building stone, 
as the underlying geologies of the old red sandstone series, a dry stone builder's dream material. Construction would have also required large amounts of timber, not least to support the massive weight of the stone roofs, a scarce commodity today as anyone who visits Orkney will find. Driftwood, however, would have supplied the majority of this. Even today, one can find whole tree trunks being washed ashore, but when you think about the rising sea levels in the Neolithic and the great primeval forests around the North Atlantic Rim being eroded, wood would have not been in short supply. However, suitable large timbers would have been needed to be stockpiled and curated, or even recycled for major projects like the Ness. Rock was not just brought to the site for building, but as a new study of so-called foreign stone shows, many other types of rock were brought to, to site for a variety of uses from across the Orkney archipelago. Rock that, that may have ordinarily ended up on the excavation spoil heap, but having the luxury of an on-site geologist, Dr. Martha Johnson, has added another important dimension to our understanding of the Ness and its wide exploitation of the landscape. Stone was, of course, also used to make a myriad of stone tools that the Ness has in abundance. Some types are unique to the Ness, such as pillow stones and polished stone spatulas, the most diverse assemblage of stone tools of any Arcadian Neolithic site. Some were made from local, yet rare forms of manganese rhodochrosite, whose single known source in Orkney has found several hundred feet down a sheer cliff face on the island of Hoy. The danger inherent in its extraction probably added to the importance of these items. The nest just did not just attract local materials, but we have evidence of material ending up at the nest that originated from across Scotland and beyond. Mace heads from the Western Isles, pitchstone from Arran, and an axe blank from the axe factories in Langdale in the Lake District. Well, one of my favourites, this polished sea urchin fossil, it could have been washed up in the shore like the amber we have found, but we may never know how it got here. And then there is a large assemblage of Neolithic art discovered at the Ness, over a thousand examples. This can be seen simply in terms of being created for visual consumption. However, research by Dr. Antonia Thomas suggests that other aspects, such as the process of working and decorating the stones, and their context and placement may be key to their significance and understanding. However, the most obvious indication of mass consumption at the Ness is the amount of rubbish produced, and that manifests itself in massive amounts of midden across the site, including at the tip of the peninsula, away from the main concentration of buildings, a monumental midden mound revealed in Trench T. This mound is over 70 metres in diameter and today survives to a height of over five metres. However, as late as the 19th century, it was even taller and a more conspicuous landmark than must have been visible from miles around. So prominent, it warranted the name Cockney Cumming, or the Mound of the Pasture. This so was not just a rubbish heap, but potentially a deliberate statement, an outward expression of the affluence and social success of those groups or individuals who gathered at Ness, a testament to the persistence of the place and perhaps to the role that Ness played as a focus for feasting and other forms of conspicuous consumption. The mine consists mainly of very fine lens of, of material, mainly ash, which makes stratigraphic excavation a nightmare. However, by combining thin section micromorphology with phytolith analysis and a range of geochemical techniques, we can get a full picture of the nature of these deposits. And for instance, the fuels being used, not just wood, but also reeds, grasses, animal dungs, but mainly peat and turf. These are the remains of innumerable heating, cooking and firing events that would have required the exploitation of a wide range of materials and indeed the landscape to satisfy fuel consumption. Whilst other constituents of the middens, such as pot, bone, coprolites, have also been identified. The carbonized remains retrieved by flotation also add to this picture. So far, little evidence has been found for the processing of cereal on site, suggesting it was processed elsewhere 
and brought to the mess, ready prepared. A similar scenario is suggested for some of the meat consumption inside, where slaughter seems to have occurred elsewhere and only joints of meat ending up at the nest. Ceramics are one of the largest categories of material culture recovered from the nest, around a metric ton, represented by circa 100,000 shirts, the largest assemblage of grooveware in the UK, representing a variety of sizes from very small, ultra-fine vessels up to very large cooking pots, which exhibit a wide range of decorative techniques, including the use of colour. Initial residue analysis and analysis studies indicate that many had contained beef or milk, which again may support the idea of large-scale feasting borne out by the bone recovered. Although bone preservation of the nest is not good, and most of it being fragmentary burnt bone, through the amazing work of Dr Ingrid Mainland and her team, much can still be gleaned from the badly preserved faunal assemblage. Studies suggest that there was an emphasis on cattle which had reached the optimum age for beef production between 30 and 36 months. The implication of these patterns compared to studies from other sites is that cattle played a more significant role at the nest than elsewhere in Orkney. A similar pattern has also emerged for the less numerous sheep at the nest, with relatively high numbers being culled as prime stock. Isotope analysis of sheep bones also suggests that, suggest that more than one herd is represented, with some individuals pastured in the coastal zone with good access to seaweed and other grazing further inland without evidence of seaweed consumption. This, and the bias against certain age groups and the mortality profile, suggests that we are not dealing with a subsistence flock, but that at least some sheep were being brought to the nest from elsewhere in Orkney. A similar scenario is suggested for the cattle, but I think more analysis is needing, needing to be completed. With an emphasis on prime meat animals and the huge quantities of bone, particularly burnt bone, recovered from the site, and the numbers of animals this likely, rep likely represents, supports the idea of large gatherings consuming massive quantities of beef, mutton, marrow, and perhaps fresh milk being brought to the site by different communities from across the islands. The evidence for mass consumption reached its zenith in one of the final acts of the nest associated with the decommissioning of the massive structure 10. After the building had been partially dismantled and infilled, accumulations of mainly cattle skulls and tibia, the latter fractured from marrow extraction, were carefully arranged around the perimeter of the building. Radiocarbon dating and stratigraphic analysis suggests that this took place over a relatively short per period of time, with red deer carcasses being later added. Being later added. By careful recording and 3D analysis, using a new technique we developed, Smart Fauna, we were able to see the special nature of this deposit and estimate that this represents the remains of over 400 cattle, a huge commitment and an extravagant symbol of consumerism. To put it into perspective, the equivalent of around 16 prime cattle from each island and parish inhabited in Orkney today. A huge communal effort to perhaps commemorate the end of the nest, nest or herald in a new and changing world. The culmination of a spiral of competitive conspicuous consumption that at times cannot be sus sustained and is perhaps a major contributory factor to the ebbing and flowing we see in Neolithic society and the nest. As ever, a huge thank you to all our past and present supporters. And if you would like to help support our charity, the Nessa Brogda Trust, then why not buy a copy of our new book, where you'll be able to find out much more about the Ness. Thank you.